Thank you so much for joining me for another weird walk today. I'm in North Dorset and I've come to Sherborne to have a look at two places of interest. We're going to check out Sherborne Old Castle, just over my shoulder there. And we're also going to have a little walk through the town and then we're going to check out Sherborne Abbey. Let's have a chat about the history of Sherborne Old Castle. It was built in the 1120s by Roger de Caen and he was at the time the Bishop of Salisbury and it was built really as a fortified palace and a place to live rather than um, any kind of fortification in case of attack. It took 15 years to complete and it was finally ready for living in in 1135. Roger was an important person and he was an aide to King Henry I and he was his principal advisor and he was also the abbot of Sherborne. However he relinquished his role as abbot in 1122 but he managed to retain the estate and the castle. In 1135 King Henry passed away and Roger began to lose favour in the royal circles. King Stephen desired control of Roger's castles and had Roger arrested and starved until he surrendered his properties to the new king, which Roger did in 1139. The castle stayed with the crown for many subsequent years and upgrades and enhancements to the fortifications were carried out. In 1592, the English explorer and favourite of Queen Elizabeth I, Sir Walter Raleigh, obtain possession of the castle. But by this time the castle had fallen into quite a state of disrepair and the costs to repair it were more than Sir Walter was willing to pay at that period. So Sir Walter stopped his focus on the old castle and moved his attentions to the hunting lodge which is now Sherborne Newcastle. However Sir Walter's dreams of living a peaceful life in his luxurious Newcastle came crashing down when Queen Elizabeth I died and in 1603 Sir Walter Raleigh was imprisoned for treason for conspiring against the new king, King James I. Sir Walter Raleigh was taken to the Tower of London where he was imprisoned for 13 years and he was finally executed on October the 29th 1618. Apparently the ghost of Sir Walter Raleigh can be seen around the grounds of the, both the old castle and the new castle. I wonder if he's about today. It's a Wednesday in May, it's half term, so the kids aren't in school, and there's nobody here. 
It's not early. It's nearly 11. What's going on? So this section that we're in here, this is supposed to be the old chapel area. It would have been stunning. So looking at this info board, it actually says this was a double layered chapel, so it had a top tier to it. It's certainly bigger than I had imagined, such extensive grounds, goes all the way around castle behind me there. Can you imagine waking up in the morning and this being your view? Just like, ah, oh. so a quick walk around my castle. It's just something else. North East Gatehouse and Outer Court. The gateway here was effectively the tradesmen's entrance where supplies, workmen and women and visitors of ordinary status entered the castle. Outside the gatehouse was the large outer court dotted with buildings. The outer court formed a settlement with lodgings for grooms, servants and those not permitted within the castle walls, as well as stables and other outbuildings. So we are here. So this looks like the little settlement area with the lodgings for the peasants. <laughs> so we can imagine here Sir Walter Raleigh waking up in his old castle and it's tatty, it needs a lot of love doing to it. He's like, you know what? Look at this. Look at that. One day it shall be mine. And it was. So this area here is the Great Hall, where they would have had their social occasions and their fine dining experiences. Looks rather grand. The Great Hall. This was the centre of social and political life at the castle. The Great Hall was used for formal meals and to feed the castle community. It was mostly demolished when Sir Walter Raleigh took ownership of the castle in the 1590s. But it said the actual kitchen was just outside of the main castle grounds, just here. And you'll see there is a well here. So they had their own source of water for the kitchen, nice and easy. And really, you're winning when you've got a castle and your own source of water as well. I mean, that's, that's definitely a win. So in a few folklore and history books that I've been looking at, I found that there is some folklore surrounding a curse that was put on Sherborne Castle by Saint Osmond, who was a bishop. He laid a curse upon the castle grounds, suggesting that anyone who tried to take the castle from the church would be cursed for life. Saint Osmond is recorded as having said these very words, whosoever shall take these lands from the bishopric or diminish them in great or small should be accursed not only in this world but also in the world to come unless in his lifetime he make restitution thereof. It certainly seems like this curse played out for Sir Walter Raleigh because it took two swings of the axe for him to finally be executed. Sadly, that is all that's left of the Great Tower. Not looking so great today, but it's still beautiful in its own kind of rustic, slighted castle kind of aesthetic. In 1642, civil war had broken out across the country 
and, in anticipation of attack, King Charles I had the castle garrisoned and its defences repaired. Cromwell's men descended on the castle, however, their first siege failed. The parliamentarians returned, carrying out an assault on the castle over 11 days. The garrison were eventually forced to retreat and the castle was captured by the parliamentarians and slighted in 1645. From this point onwards, Sherborne Old Castle saw a more peaceful life and in the 1700s, the surrounding area was landscaped and the castle ruins became the picturesque romantic ruin we can see today. Well, Oliver Cromwell may have called the castle malicious and mischievous, but I think it's rather charming. So we're going to say goodbye now to Sherborne Old Castle. We're going to head through Sherborne Town. Hopefully I'll be able to show you a few bits and pieces through there. And we're going to make our way to Sherborne Abbey. The Diocese of Sherborne was created in AD 705 and Aldham, Abbot of Malmesbury, was appointed as the first bishop of the West Saxons. Aldham's new cathedral of Sherborne went on to serving 26 Saxon bishops and many of the Saxon features can still be seen. After the Norman conquest, the bishop seat was moved from Sherborne to Salisbury but the cathedral then became a Benedictine house until the dissolution of the monasteries in 1539. In the 15th century, this seemingly peaceful place of worship saw some conflict between the monks and the local people. The monks decided that they did not want the townspeople to use the abbey for worship, so they set about building a separate, smaller church, which they joined onto the abbey. This new church was called the Church of All Hallows, and as you can imagine, the townsfolk were more than a little disgruntled, having been pushed out of the church they had always used. Tensions came to a head in 1437, when the people of Sherborne had had enough of having to ask the abbot each time they wanted to use the font for a baptism, so they decided to build their own font in the new All Hallows Church. The abbot was enraged by this, and it is said he sent a stout butcher armed with a hammer to break the smaller new font. This caused a riot, and a flaming arrow was fired by a civilian into the east end of the abbey, which caused a fire to spread around the wooden scaffoldings which had been erected for roof repairs. The Pope himself was called upon to settle the conflict, and the townspeople had to pay for any damage they caused to the abbey. After the Reformation, the local people were allowed to regain possession of their beloved abbey. They pulled down the All Hallows Church and moved back into the abbey, which was now a parish church and has remained so ever since. <laughs> 